The UK Prime Minister has promised to ban from stadiums people who abuse footballers online. That's after three black England players were racially targeted after their loss at the Euro final. Why is the abuse happening and what can be done to stop it? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. Last Sunday's Euro Championship final was meant to be a unifying moment for England, who reached that stage for the first time in 55 years. Instead, three black players who helped achieve that accomplishment faced a barrage of racial abuse from fans online after missing penalties. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has pledged to ban those who racially abuse footballers from stadiums for up to 10 years. He's also threatening to fine tech companies if they fail to prevent racist content appearing on their platforms. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment. First, this report from Nadim Baba. A statement of solidarity. Protesters at a mural of England footballer Marcus Rashford in Manchester, which was defaced after Sunday's Euros final. Rashford's well known for his successful campaign for more free school meals during the pandemic. He and two other young black players received online racial abuse after failing to score penalties against Italy. That was at the heart of Wednesday's Prime Minister's questions, the Labour opposition accusing the government of using anti-racism as a political football. The government has been trying to stoke a culture war and they've realised they're on the wrong side. And now they hope that nobody's noticed. Why else would a Conservative MP boast that he's not watching his own team? Why else would another Conservative MP say, say that Marcus Rashford spends too much time playing politics when he's actually trying to feed children that the government won't? Boris Johnson said he utterly condemned the abuse and would amend football banning orders. They're normally used to bar individuals who take part in, for example, racist chanting or hooliganism from attending matches. Now they'll cover online racism, while Johnson's put the tech giants on notice. I made it absolutely uh, clear to them that we will legislate to address this problem, Mr Speaker, in the online harms bill. And unless they get, unless they get hate and racism off their platforms, they will face fines amounting to 10% of their global revenues. Johnson refused to say whether he was wrong not to condemn supporters who booed the England team before the tournament for taking the knee, an anti-discrimination gesture. Previously, he'd defended the fans' right to do so. And his Home Secretary went further at the start of the Euros, criticising the team taking the knee. I just don't support, you know, people participating in, you know, that type of gesture, gesture politics to a certain extent. So when Patel tweeted her disgust at the racist abuse after the final, England player Tyrone Mings was furious, writing, You don't get to stoke the fire at the beginning of the tournament by labelling our anti-racism message as gesture politics and then pretend to be disgusted when the very thing we're campaigning against happens. Now some Conservative politicians say the government's getting its messaging wrong and needs to reflect on how that impacts real-life racism. Now, this man, Raheem Sterling, is another England player who's been on the receiving end of racism, not just online, but at times from popular newspapers as well. He was included in the team of the tournament, a selection of the best performers at the Euros. His outstanding contribution and England making the final may have increased public support for the team's anti-racism tactics. But the real breakthrough could be when black players are listened to whatever they do or don't achieve on the pitch. Nadine Barber, Al Jazeera, London. In the hometown of striker Marcus Rashford, one of the players racially targeted after Sunday's loss, fans responded with messages of support and solidarity after his mural was vandalised. Here's some of what they had to say. I've got mixed race kids. I'm a local girl. I think it's disgusting the way the government treat black people in this like it's absolutely nothing, encouraging them to be vile and think against black people. It's just disgusting. I'm just here to give my support to a movement that I believe in, that everyone's equal. But if them three lads miss them, if they scored them three penalties, they want to be cheering with them, not cheering against them, you know what I mean? So I think everyone should try to cut themselves on and support them because they got us to the final. That's the most we've got in years, so we should pump for it. I'm here to support the local community and also for the support of the footballers. 
I don't think it should be happening in this day and age. It's been going on far too long, far too long. And as people said, if he would have scored, it would have been a different outcome. Well, let's bring in our guests for today's Inside Story. In Newcastle, Clark Carlisle, a former Premier League player and co-chair of the Players Advisory Board at Kick It Out. In London, Anita Abayomi, a sports journalist and the co-founder and host of Gold Diggers podcast. And also in Newcastle, Paul Cairns, deputy chief executive of the show Racism, the Red Card, UK's largest anti-racism educational charity. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being on Inside Story. Clark, uh, let me start with you in Newcastle. What do you make of Prime Minister Johnson's condemnation of racism and his promise to ban online racist football fans? Does it say, send a strong enough signal? Um, well, thank you for inviting me to contribute, first of all, for it. And does it send a strong enough signal? Uh, the, the thing about the actions of our politicians is that they can be so contradictory. And to, to take one stance three weeks earlier uh, and take a different stance now, it is... It, it is something that perpetuates the ambiguity that I think currently exists within society in England, especially around how seriously we address issues and instances of racism and racist uh, racial discrimination. Mm. So those words that, that he's brought forth in the past couple of days, they are exactly the tone that is necessary when you're trying to take a top-down, firm, zero-tolerance approach against racism. But it's a tone that has to be continued throughout the rest of the year when it is not a sensational headline in the news right. and the focus of attention. Anita, your thoughts. How deep is this issue of racism in English football? I imagine, of course, this is not new, but it's being talked about a lot more precisely because of social media. Yeah, and it shouldn't have taken social media for, you know, the prime minister and the governing bodies to understand that this racism is an actual issue. Of course, taking the stars, just like you said, Clark, a couple of weeks ago, saying that, you know, there's no racism in the country and taking the knee was a political gesture in the words of Preeti Patel, saying things like these has a, has had a detrimental effect to society at this moment in time. There's so much ambiguity surrounding the idea of racism, mm -hmm. what is accepted, what is not accepted, that we are struggling that as a society to understand that racism in itself should not be allowed on social media or in real life as well. So I think we are far away from becoming a country where we can accept that racism is a, a huge problem, but we are definitely making steps towards it. Uh, Paul, your thoughts. Uh, the Prime Minister said something very interesting. He said racism is deeply rooted in English society. Do you agree with him? Yeah, ab absolutely. The question you asked earlier was... What, what, what is the level of racism or what's the problem of racism within football? Um, the problem of racism with, within football will always mirror the problem of racism within society. We've, we live in a deeply divided society um, and certain instances and certain things that have happened have, have emboldened certain people to, to feel stronger, that they can espouse these particular racist uh, views and beliefs. And, and that means we're starting to see racism creep back in to football at all levels, including at the very the very highest level of the game. We're seeing racist, racism within crowds of Premier League games. And now, sadly, we're seeing England players being racially abused online after, after the biggest game that, that's probably taken place this year. Clark, talk to us about your own experience, if you can. What has been your most harrowing experience as a footballer? What, what impact does this racist abuse have on players? 
Um, it has a, a, a very sizable uh, and direct impact on players um, because it is a personal affront to you. And it's a personal affront that questions your validity to belong in society, let alone in that industry. You know, I was born in England. I was born in Preston. I represented my town, my district, my county and my country. Yet I have to face uh, a portion, a, a small but vocal portion of society that view, that prides itself on being tolerant of me. You know, uh, we, we we talk about the power of words and it goes way beyond semantics when the, my home nation prides itself on the fact that it's a tolerant society and it tolerates my presence in my home community. Well, that is not acceptable. So, you know, when you're talking about individual harrowing incidents, do you know they're not anywhere near as destructive as the microaggressions that I face on a daily basis when I walk around in my own community and I see my next door neighbour pull her handbag closer to her, mm. when I'm at the train station and I see a family move further along the platform, when I, I, I'm stopped at night and the police officer says, you're driving a very nice car late at night, sir. Mm. You know, these, these strip away at my core identity as a human being being and make me constantly question whether I belong in my own community. Right. That's not right. So it's it's happening not just in football, but in society every day from what you tell us. Just, just coming back to the players in football, Clark, what are the players being abused for most of the time? Of course, we saw the incident after the Euro final. Is it for making a mistake, like missing a penalty, or is it for the colour of their skin? skin? Uh, Fully, it, it, it's. Uh, I, I think that that could, that's the type of question that takes us away from this core issue. That's like asking someone who's attacked in the street, "What were you doing before you were attacked mm. in but the street?" But it's a question that a lot that's of people asking. ask. It's a question I'm asking it because a lot of people, unfortunately, it's a type of question that a lot of people is still asking. Uh, but that's a victim-facing question, mm. you know, that, that, that that's totally inappropriate in this circumstance. Mm. I would bring us to Nadine's closing line in, in the intro, where, when uh, we, we can state that we've made progress when a person's um, performance in their field right. is totally unrelated to how they are accepted mm. with, 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 the, uh, with regards to their protected characteristics. It's utterly irrelevant for it and I agree you know, with you but I'm asking it again because unfortunately that's that's a rhetoric that you'll hear from a majority of people not just in England but in France where I am from or other places as well uh, yeah, and it, it's it's a fundamental position that we have to question. Mm. We have to turn the question around to those people who are right. asking the question and say, do I have to justify my experience mm -hmm. and, and my right to be in a community mm -hmm. only by excelling exactly. in certain areas? Okay. And if I fall less than those standards, do I suddenly become unacceptable or, mm. or subhuman? No, that that's not the the that's not the the state of play that that we believe mm -hmm. society should mm -hmm. operate from. Right. Anita, let me bring you on this. And uh, Clark made an important point talking about the fact that this is a small but vocal, very vocal portion of people. Who yeah. or what is encouraging this type of behaviour? Um, firstly, I, I totally I disagree with the fact that it's a small but vocal um, group of people. I think the issue is much larger than we actually believe it is because we take a look at the actual spectrum of society and we actually see a large percentage of society who will vote against, you know, things to help black people in their rightfully and respective positions and things to help them grow and things to help them, you know, persevere through, through this racism and say that this is things such as gesture politics, as opposed to what um, Preeti Patel did mention. But when it comes to what fuels this, mm. I, I'm not too sure. There's nothing that should be fueling it at this stage. We're in a society where we pride ourselves, especially as a Londoner, we pride ourselves for our diversity. So whatever can be fueling all of this, it has to come from right at the top, which is where I point 
you know, kind of the blame towards the government. The government should be clamping down on racial issues, on racial inequalities that are going on in society. And once those are clamped down on, then society will begin to take this issue a lot more seriously. The issue, the issue continues because the government allows it to continue because there's not enough, you know, there's not enough reprimand and there's not enough punishment that goes towards being racially abused. Okay, we'll talk in a moment about what punishment and what action should be taken. But I want to ask Paul about the, the, you know, the taking the knee gesture. I mean, when UK football resumed in June 2020 after the, the COVID uh, hiatus, players adopted this anti-racism gesture, taking the knee in response to the killing of George Floyd in the US, of course. Has anything changed at all as a result of that gesture? And I'm not talking about the Euro final. Do you think it's made a difference at all, even if a small one? I think on a, on a sec section of society, I think, the take the knee is a powerful gesture. I think that um, it's helped to get the message home to a number of people throughout the UK of why the players are doing it, but clearly not enough people. And clearly there's been miscommunication and misinformation around the taking of the knee gesture. And I think at the beginning of the tournament, Gareth Southgate and the England players have been very, very clear about why they're taking the knee, that it is an anti-racism gesture. It's not a political gesture. And if anything, it's actually a human rights gesture. So anybody who has abused players or booed players for, for then taking the knee as, as an anti-racism gesture needs to take a long, hard look at themselves and realise that they're booing anti-racism and that they're booing a human rights issue. And it's not just in the UK. There have been many other incidents of racial abuse on and off the pitch. In Italy, several black players have complained of racist abuse from fans, including Mario Balotelli, who's had bananas thrown at him while playing. Bulgaria's national football team was ordered to play behind closed doors after fans' racist behaviour during a Euro 2020 qualifier against England in 2019. And FIFA charged Russia, the host of the last World Cup in 2018, with fan racism after black French players were targeted. Let's talk about the solutions now. What, what needs to happen? Uh, social media companies, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, say they're committed, of course, to tackling all forms of online abuse. And they point out that they've invested uh, in systems and processes that result in better monitoring and detection. But obviously, this hasn't been entirely effective. What else needs to happen to change this type of behaviour? Well, I, I go back to what Anita said, and I totally agree with it. There are three fundamental parts uh, of when an incident of racism occurs that have to be followed through. One is the reporting of the incident. Mm. What we find is the vast majority of incidents aren't reported because there is no trust within any system that it is capable to deal effectively with the incident. So having one vehicle to report to, and everyone knows that's where you report incidents of racial abuse to. Second is an investigative process that is independent of the vested stakeholders uh, and is thorough and forensic and collates all the evidence around the incident. And then thirdly, it's brought to a judicial conclusion mm. so that there are repercussions in law for those who, who, who uh, commit these offences. And the difficulty is, Valley, is that in the UK, these are offences. These are criminal offences under many different acts. Under but are they not being punished? No, they're not. And, and this why is, is the that? problem. Yeah. Communications Act, the Race Relations Act, the Communications Act, mm. uh, and this is why there is no faith in in the system to deal with this. Now, uh, people's attentions turn to the the platforms. The Facebook, Twitter, uh, etc., and they are taking these posts down. That doesn't solve the problem. All that does is silence the people who, who are the source of the problem. You know, if I was to say to the police, I know who did a crime, mm. but I'm not telling you, I'd be obstructing justice. Right. If I actually told the world that I know who did the crime, but I'm not telling you, I'd be perverting the course of justice. And this is where I believe social media platforms need to step in. When there is an investigation, they need to provide any and all evidence that they have. And that's the bit that needs to be addressed in, in UK law in the online harms bill.
Anita, your thoughts, what needs to happen for real change to actually happen? For people's pockets yeah. to be perhaps affected? Yeah, so I am totally on board with what Clark said. And on top of that, I think um, Boris Johnson, he has come out and he has said that he will, you know, result to fining these social media companies. I think it was 10% of their global revenue. For me, the uh, that kind of punishment is not good enough. Taking 10% mm. of a social media's, social media's global revenue is nothing to them. You know, we need to hold people accountable. We need to find ways to get these people who are involved in the um, racial abuse online. And we need to find a way to hold them accountable for their own um, actions. And like Clark said, this is a criminal problem. This, all of these um, racist abuse should be take uh, racist abusers should be taken to court and they should be criminally trialed because this is against the law. I myself, as a sports journalist, I have been subject to horrific racial abuse just for reporting things such as you know if Eng England losing the Euros. By reporting that, I am subject to racist abuse, mm. and all of this has become very frustrating, especially for people of color. It's become very frustrating because we cannot turn to social media and like I'm. Um, said about reporting even if we report it what will social media do about it you know there's no faith in social media there's no faith in the government and both the government and social media need to come together and find a way to criminally criminally charge these abusers online and that's the only way we can find a solution for all of this racist abuse to stop online because if we keep if we keep standing here and trying to find these social media companies nothing is going to get done. So the issue, the punishment shouldn't be monetary. Right. It should definitely be right. in a criminal court of justice. Paul, there are tons of campaigns out there right now. Um, stop online hate, show racism the red card, stand up to, uh, to racism, to name just a few. Uh, Anita j said, no faith in social media right now, no faith in the government. Who do you think is ultimately responsible for making sure change happens? I think, like Anita said, it's up, it's up to government and social media companies to come together, um, maybe with anti-racism campaigners, maybe with um, Premier League, FA and, and other key bodies and key players, and to take a, a unified and united approach to this issue. Um, but where the anti-racism campaigns come into this is, is the medium of education. You, you said, how are we going to solve this problem? I'd show racism the red card, and I know Kick It Out believe the same, is that education will always be the key to tackling racism. Um, myself and Clark have sat on a number of panels educating young people over many years about, about these issues, and that is the only way we will effectively tackle racism in the long term. All right. Clark, I'll give you the last word. We've talked about the actions that social media companies uh, and the government should be taking, but how best do we support players who have been racially abused? Oh, I'm, I'm delighted you brought it round to this point because, you know, because the players are seemingly in a fortunate position, our attention seems to turn away from them when they are the, the victims in this situation. And as a players board, we are directly reaching out to those players so that they know in no uncertain terms that they are being supported as human beings. And, you know, we have the, the victim support unit with, with the UK police force force where civilians can turn to but I think in this situation where it is such a um, you know almost a segregated portion of society the industry of football is a very closed bubble I think within we need to identify the individuals and support them on an individual basis according to their needs irrespective of the politics and rhetoric that go on above all right thank you so very much for a very interesting an insightful discussion. Clark Carly, Anita Abayomi, and Paul Kins, thank you so much for being with us on Inside Story. And thank you for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully Batibo, and the whole team here in Doha, thank you very much for watching. Bye for now.